Good morning. Good morning, Seth. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Brian. Yes. So I'll give a little intro of myself and the conversation, then I'll give you some space to introduce yourself and we'll we'll take it from there. So my name is Brad Kirshner, and I've been in the education field for the past 20 years or so, first as a teacher and then as a school leader. Um, I'm also someone who has spent a good amount of time studying psychology and philosophy and religion, and I'm interested in some contemporary conversations that are happening right now in regard to um, the various crises that we're facing as a civilization and as and, and as a species on the planet. Some people are calling that the meta crisis. Some people are referring to the meaning crisis. Um, and there are some different, you know, things that I'll reference throughout related to that. But just to just to frame my my interest and my inquiry here is pretty broad. I'm really interested in, you know, what kinds of thinking, what kinds of frameworks can really help humanity at this juncture in time to make sense of the world, to think about both what has happened and what is happening and how we move forward together. Um, and also as the I'm, I'm currently head of school at Kimberton Waldorf School. So I've been doing some studying around Waldorf education, and Rudolf Steiner. And in that work, I've come across your work, Seth, and I've, uh, you, you're, you're doing a substack now called The Whole Social. So I've read some of your essays and they've been very relevant. And I was so happy actually to find someone who's bringing ideas and concepts related to Steiner and Waldorf education sort of into the contemporary conversation and really looking, looking at what's happening in the world and trying to make it relevant and meaningful for people so I thought we could really have a great conversation thinking about the overlapping and relationships between the, these different conversations. There's Waldorf, there's Steiner, there's social threefolding, which you're focusing on. And then there's also these bigger conversations that just have to do with the meta crisis that we're in. And where, where are we at as a species right now? What do we need to do? What do we need to be thinking about as humanity as we move into the 21st century? So starting there really broadly, I'd love to just give you a chance to can you just introduce yourself, say a little bit about, about yourself and, and, and the work that you've been doing with The Whole Social? Yeah, um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, really glad to be here. Um, so, yeah, um, I think I maybe I'll just mention it now. I did go to Waldorf School, so, um, so I grew up in that kind of, yeah, educational uh, experience and afterwards college and kind of out into the world. Um, at some point I did... Um, I wasn't particularly interested in, in, um, how to say that in kind of business life or politics, I was kind of more just, um, interested in cultural life and, um, and doing what I thought was good work at the time. Um, and then I encountered Steiner's social ideas, which we'll talk a bit about. And that really, um, yeah, that really woke me up to, um, if, yeah, just to kind of a greater understanding or a greater picture of of society and kind of where it needs to move in order to become healthy um and then so that really that was my mid-20s i was 25 that really led to um kind of giving everything i have to that so maybe i'll just say i don't i don't think you're aware of it when i was 25 26 we started a kind of a number of young people who i knew from college and also from high school and, and the like we started an organization called think outward which was focused. It was a kind of like secondary education, post yeah, post college education, um, where we were working with standard social ideas. So that was like five, six, seven years um, where we did conferences, we did workshop, um, and really kind of tried to yeah make sense and kind of looking at standard social ideas in relationship to media, in relationship to education, in relationship to nature and climate change and agriculture and every field really. That's what we kind of focus on. Um, so then, since then, that education, that kind of project ended, and um, since then, yeah, I've done what one does in life, which is take on different tasks, take on different jobs. Um, I've worked, really worked, especially in relationship to kind of bringing kind of some organizational capacity in relationship to um, an institute around natural science called the, uh, the Nature Institute up in upstate New York and also around the arts. Um, I've done a lot around the arts and especially around funding the arts, working with musicians and artists, um, crowdfunding and the like. Um, and then the whole time I've been working on standard social ideas. And um, so in the last few years, I've really kind of given that my my main energy. Um, so I started the whole social two years ago. And that's been my my kind of main work in a sense. 
and still doing work with organizations um, here and there, working with groups. I'm working with a group in Wisconsin, um, doing kind of community organizing um, in that in that um, yeah in that town in that community in that mm-hmm. region around the relationship of of the business community to the to the political community to the cultural life. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's kind of been where I've where I've been for the last while. Nice. So let's maybe start with a little intro into social threefolding. Mm-hmm. That's this one of the main ideas that I feel like you're trying to share and spread and just make make relevant and meaningful for people how would you how would you help someone who's really not familiar with with what that is understand both what it's in reference to and also why it's relevant and meaningful right now for us to be thinking about yeah um so i mean just the most the most basic picture when we think of society and we think of kind of like the the powerful actors in society the people who are making decisions and who are kind of yeah deciding how things how things look, um, we usually think about business and government and we think about big business and we think about big government. Um, and we think about, yeah, the political leaders especially, but then, yeah, kind of going head to head with corporate leaders and especially the right left divide tends to kind of, um, yeah, the, the conservatives tend to be more about small government and tend to be fine with business doing whatever it wants. Um, and the left tends to be more about large government and kind of keeping uh, corporate interests kind of, um, yeah, within bounds. But those tendencies also shift from year to year and from presidency to presidency, obviously, and everybody's beholden to corporate interests and all the rest of it. I mean, it's those are just very loose kind of definitions. Um, but then also within that framework, we talk about the culture wars. Um, and that just means that there are different cultural groups. Um, there are different like groups that have different values, the Christians or the liberals or whoever it is, um, all the different kind of um ethnic groups and yeah they have different values and they're kind of battling it out and they're battling it out especially for kind of like political power um they want to yeah to run the government or they want the country to reflect their values um and so the insight that steiner had that was so crucial was that these are actually three dramatically different and kind of qualitatively different activities in life so in the same way we talk about three functions to government and there needs to be a separation of power between those three functions. There needs to be checks and balances. Steiner saw that it was the same with society at large, that government is just radically different in its essence than business. It's radically different in its essence than cultural activity. And cultural activity is the one that everyone really says, like, what, what is that? You know, when I first started working with these ideas, friends and family for years wouldn't remember what the third sphere of society was, that there was, there was business and government and culture. Um, But culture is so important. Um, Yeah, it's so it's so important for kind of what you were describing as the meaning crisis, because culture refers to the development of the human being, everything that has to do with the development of the human being and the realm of creativity, of inspiration, of all these things. So education, you could say, is the kind of key institution in a way of culture that that's really focused on on the development of human beings. But again, journalism is focused on educating human beings. It's it's focused on that. Religion is focused on the soul life of the human being. Art, science, you know, all these things are the pursuit of knowledge. It's the life of the mind in general. Um, And it's just, yeah, when that is run, I mean, an easy example is when government or business kind of tells journalists what to write, what happens to journalism? When government or business kind of controls what research is done, what science has done because they want to to pursue they want to pursue certain avenues when we don't have pure science and we don't have pure thinking but it's always being kind of paid for by this person so you have to come to their conclusions then the life of culture the life of the soul um, the life of the mind is stunted um, and with it the life of meaning the life of yeah i mean you could say the meaning crisis and all the deaths of despair and things like that um if if culture was really healthy, it would mean it would mean every individual. So Steiner brings a picture in in his economics lectures. He gave fourteen lectures just on economics to like students of of economics and teachers and the and the like. Um, but in there, he says, just imagine every human being um, developing themselves to the full, and that's a kind of a picture of what we should be doing. We should be living in a world where we want to maximize human capacities because that's what they give, that's what all of us give to society. Um, And instead we wanna kind of, 
educate people so that they fit into society as it already is so that they fit into businesses um you know that already exist and kind of how the government sees the economy evolving um instead of just evo just educating people so they can become themselves and then out of themselves creating new you know our our political ideals and our and our new innovations and new economic forms mm -hmm. so that's kind of big picture does that give us sense yeah. for it? yeah it does and what's coming up for me is i'm really interested in how we understand that framework in conversation with uh, evolutionary or developmental framework that I think a lot of people in conversations that I'm with are, are very interested in. For instance, if we just think very broadly about, you know, you can think in terms of technology and yeah. infrastructure and society, um, like social complexity from hunting and gathering to agrarian to industrial to, to digital, or you yeah. can think in terms of like traditional to modern to postmodern, there are these broad movements. Yeah. And what yeah. I found is that even back referencing to what you said about like the polarization and the left versus right, yeah. what I find is helpful for people to get out of that sort of binary way of framing culture and society and really think more in terms of different structures of complexity and yeah. understanding what happened in the move to modernity. Like what does modernity mean? What were the sort of qualitative changes that happened socially and culturally? And actually yeah. one, one way that I've heard um, modernity described, I think might dovetail interestingly with threefolding, because this is actually something that is talked about in integral theory, for instance, that if you think about the difference between pre-modern and modern, there's many differences. But one way to frame that is actually a, a separation of the value sphere. So for instance, if you think of a pre-modern society, the art and the religion and whatever was taken to be truth or science at that time were all kind of fused, you know, like there was religious art. And what was yeah. true was what the church said, for instance, right? Those things were fused. They weren't differentiated. And then one, one broad way to think about the evolution of modernity is the differentiation of those value spheres so that art could go its own path. It didn't have to perpetuate yeah. religious narratives. And science could go its own path and actually pursue truth, not held down by dogma and, and sort of preconceived understandings of what's real and what's true. And that led to a lot of innovation and just cultural evolution to, to allow science to be free from religion, to allow art to be free from religion. But, to, but then the cultural sphere um, shifted significantly. And if you you know, continue to track that sort of development um, back to sort of the meaning crisis, you know, I feel like we've sort of lost what the right balance is between those things is maybe one way to think about it. And through the sort of, you know, unfolding of the last few hundred years, this is also something that Steiner was very aware of. We've, we've, we've come into a place that is um, by default sort of assumed to be materialist. Mm -hmm. And like the, the separation of science from religion and culture in some ways has led to sort of science in some ways dominating and creating a very sort of materialist understanding. And a devaluing of religion as seeing religion as that mythical pre-modern belief structure that needs to be let go of. But we haven't really found a way to, to bring meaning and purpose back into our worldview. Um, and then one thought, one thing that you just pointed to, which I'm not sure if I've thought about before, is just like those, those things were differentiated. But now what we see as a problem is 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 a um, an unhealthy way of bringing them back together. For instance, now if if the government is now again controlling science, right? That's not a good thing. So we have to have healthy differentiation. So I guess the question I'm coming to is, you know, seeing the value of that differentiation, and then thinking about what's the right relationship between them. You know, and is that the, the, does that resonate with? Sort of what you're trying to get at with social threefolding it's about what's the relationship between these different spheres how do they stay both independent but in but not not fractured um and not letting one predominate it, it, is does that resonate or make sense with with, with social threefolding yeah definitely i mean that is that is kind of the the question in a sense um so if we if we recognize just fundamentally that these three activities do exist um and that let's just say education is not like a political activity um, or yeah, politics is not an economic activity. Like if we recognize that they're, that they're different, then the question just does become, okay, how do we discern 
what should be their proper balance, like what should be within, you know, each other, which within their own purview. Um, and how should, yeah, what should decision making look like there? Um, you know, what is it for the for the government to decide the curriculum for for a social science teacher in Texas and say, like, you have to teach critical race theory or you can't teach critical race theory. And then the next administration, you have to like, what does it do yeah. for an educator to constantly be told by bureaucrats who have no relation? I mean, who know? who have never been in a classroom, what they're teaching. Like, what does it do to the human? What does it do to the, to the educator? I mean, you can, so many yeah. teachers are fleeing the field of education right now because of, yeah, all the pressure they're experiencing. Um, but it's just like, what would it mean for educators to be working out of their own inspiration? Um, yeah. It's a wild thought. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I was just, I, I, I just, I thought to make a connection too between, you know, just to kind of continue what I was saying, what, I feel like one thing that's emerging now is this notion of like what's after the postmodern and what's after postmodernity. And I'm yeah. wondering if there's a there's a way that bringing social threefolding into the conversation of what does a healthy post postmodern society look like is an interesting question. Because if you track this development of, um, you know, one one thing about that happened in modernity too with this differentiation, you also get these really sort of grand narratives of like what is true, partly because of how science evolved. Yeah. But then the postmodern pushback to that is still seeing how you can't make, it's really hard to make, you know, claims that are applied to everyone and sort of yeah. deconstructing and relativizing things. So yeah. when, once you start to critique some of the over simple sort of grand narratives that came out of modernity and you start to poke holes in some of the thoughts and beliefs that emerged in modernity yeah. that has been a skill set that has become developed in post-modernity but it's also led from um from a sense of you know the sort of objective materialism and sense of like science is truth that yeah. emerged in modernity to now a sort of sense of cynicism and even nihilism and relativism where there's a lot of confusion in the world right now that's rooted in a sense that well no one gets to say what's true and there is no objectivity and everything is subjective and relative to your culture. Yeah. And that's deeply problematic and yeah. unstable. And so part of what's happening now is people are realizing that people are able to not just be in that way of looking at things, but look at it and sort of objectify it in a sense and get a sense of what what is this worldview or structure of thought that's so critical of modernity and the modern world and yet it actually has some internal contradictions and, and some confusions and is leading to a lot of social and cultural problems. Now there's like a new subculture. I think there's networks of, of subcultures around the planet that are emerging, trying to get beyond that sort of impasse of relativism and cynicism and nihilism, which connects back to the meaning crisis too. Like the meaning crisis is people have lost this sense of purpose and meaning and grand narrative because there's just so much chaos and confusion and, and a sense of relativism. So that's one way to frame that is what some people are calling meta modernism or meta modernity. So that's sort of getting meta on what modernity and post modernity are, it's being able to take a step back and look at that historical emergence of these different these different um, worldviews and these different sort of social cultural structures that have emerged, and yeah. how to how to weave people and cultures and narratives and stories together in a meaningful way. So that we're not just stuck with, oh, well, those people believe that and these people believe that and I'm going to choose to believe this, but nobody's going to really make any truth claims or any claims to objectivity. I think what we're finding is that's not a sustainable way forward when we actually are faced with global species level crises that we have to coordinate our behavior, right? We yeah. have to coordinate our stories and our narratives and our behavior to solve real problems, real global crises. So there's this meta level narrative i feel like that has to become established and it is becoming established um but it has to be done in a way that is somehow inclusive and pulls people into it and also allows for genuine diversity of viewpoint somehow yeah um so i'm wondering too if you can just riff or, or build yeah. on that like what are the connections between that sort of picture which i feel like i'm seeing when yeah. i look at the world and then yeah. well, like what is social how can social threefolding help us do that yeah. Um, it's a great picture and it's a great question. Um, and it's, yeah, it's wonderful to go to where, to where it leads me, which is, um, so, I mean, the, 
the the work that Steiner brought um, is a kind of path of knowledge, and the path of knowledge comes. I mean, so he grounds it in um, Goethe's work. So Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who, yeah, whose years I can't say off the top of my head, but um, it's you know 18th century Goethe had a way of doing science which was different than the mainstream way, and so and yeah. You know, he's made some discoveries that science still says like, oh, that's great. But kind of he was, you know, considered a kind of outlier. But Goethe's way of doing science, when Goethe looked out into the world, he saw that the scientific method, the scientific project was was to reduce everything to purely material terms. So to reduce everything to mathematical, especially mathematical and kind of physicalist terms. Um, so if you want to understand, um, yeah you want to understand the human mind or you want to understand uh, animal or plant life, or you want to understand whatever it is, social life, then you try to get quantifiable data and, and, you know, uh, do whatever kind of um, uh, mathematics that you can possibly do on it in order to come out with something which looks like science. Um, and for Goethe, this was an absurdity and also just fundamentally unhealthy and untrue. So, what, what Goethe kind of described, and I do think it's it's very much completely pointing in the direction that you're describing, um, was that every, every realm of phenomena needs to be taken seriously in its own rights. So plant life is not just mineral life. It's not just physical matter that can be reduced to purely physical processes. There is, there are also life processes that are that's beyond the purely physical and animal life. There's a sentience there that's beyond plant and 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 uh, mineral life, um, and so at every at every level, instead of the project which which we've had since the Enlightenment of just reducing, reducing, reducing back to the most basic, if we just if we just respect things for what they are and and take things seriously in themselves, and so what that means is. You know, for for Goethe to do a plant study, for instance, it would mean um, coming to know everything about the plant in every single in the way that every scientist does. But then but then doing more than that, which was to to take the life of the plant to not just to dissect it and kind of come up with you know, what its composition is, but to kind of observe the plant in its environment, in other environments, to to pay attention to it so that you could you could recreate it inside of yourself. You could recreate the life cycle of the plant inside of yourself. Um, you know, he, he talked about exact sensorial imagination where you want to develop your perceptive imaginative capacities so that they match reality completely. So when you move just beyond the kind of reductive, everything is physical, everything is mathematical, um, at that level, everything becomes abstract and also everything can become purely intellectual. When you take things seriously for what they are, then all of a sudden you have to develop yourself so that you actually are interested in them and that you actually love them. You have to care for the skunk cabbage enough that day in and day out, you go and observe the skunk cabbage. You have to care about the giraffe enough. You have to care about um, finance enough. You have to care about um, any aspect of life. You have to care about your partner enough. You have to care about your community enough that you just try to pay attention to what it is in its own rights and not reduce it to some stats and try to come up with a formula for how it could be healthy. Instead, so this is also what Steiner said in terms of education. He said, you bring together you know, a dozen people and tell them to create a good idea for what a school should look like and they'll come up with the most brilliant ideas. And he said, and they'll be genuinely like clever, good ideas, um, but they won't work. Like they simply won't work because the reality on the ground is that you have these teachers with these children and those teachers, what educates the children is what lives in those teachers. And what educates the child is the teacher's capacity to perceive the child. Yes, they have to understand the subjects they're teaching, but then they have to understand it so well that they can leave it behind and just perceive the child in front of them and what the child actually needs to be nourished. Like what the child's capacities are that need to be watered. You know, what the child's capacities are that need to be drawn out. Um, so, that is the kind of that's the fundamental i would say um the fundamental kind of work of steiner's philosophy anthroposophy that's the kind of path of knowledge and what it does is what you described which is i think if you can do it and so like yeah how hard is this to do 
Mm-hmm. I mean, this is such an impossible thing. But you know, if you don't do it, we just come up with these intellectual frameworks for how things should unify. But yeah. instead, what it means is that we have to actually take such an interest in different cultures that we understand them for their own, you know, out of themselves. We don't just kind of impose things on them. We have to understand people so well that we can move beyond what's generic into them to their individuality. Like we have to actually like, develop new. That's what I would say, like metamodernism would be moving beyond modernity would mean like developing capacities where we actually and their capacities of thinking, feeling and willing of head, heart and hands where we actually come to like perceive these things in each other. And then maybe just sorry, one last thing is, you know, the League of Nations in Steiner's time Mm -hmm. was what becomes the UN um, was this project that was coming, you know, being initiated after World War One. And Steiner said, this is absurd. And it's absurd because it's not actually born of different cultural national groups being interested in one another and coming together out of that interest to kind of work together. Instead, it's a purely political pursuit and it's just going to be, you know, everybody trying to get as much as possible for they, as they can for themselves. Um, what's needed is this actual, yeah, taking an interest in other cultures and other ways of life and other value systems. And some people won't do that. Some people will just want to protect their own but that's yeah. also all right. Like that's where they're at. They can't reach out of themselves. So yeah, that's kind of big picture. Yeah, no, that's a great connection. It's, it's actually a way of bringing it really down to earth and making it concrete in terms yeah. of practice too. And I, the way you describe Goethe, when I think now of Goethe and Steiner, one of the things that's really interesting to uh, reinterpret them in light of what's emerged since, since they passed yeah. and in light of what I just said, there, there, there is a very real way in which they were bringing a very metamodern sensibility in the sense that they were already very critical of modern reductionism and materialism and and like you're saying really the over abstraction and, and and just the the reduction of beauty and life and the complexity of reality yeah. to the kind of abstractions and thinkings that emerged through modern science which were very useful and practical and helpful but the downside of them was, they were very reductive and overly simplified and there wasn't full awareness or consciousness of all that was being lost in, in that kind of scientific materialism. But they also didn't, instead of just anticipating sort of postmodern critiques of that, they were already pointing toward very embodied um, and practical and artistic ways of actually being in the world that resolves that problem. Right. And I feel that is very much what the meta modern sensibility is. And also, you know, the integral women, anyone who's really trying to figure this out, there is a, also a movement toward um, embodiment and just healing, healing the yeah. traumas of the past and also all, you know, the traumas that, he, that have emerged in intercultural and intersocial conflict and violence and warfare from pre modern times in, through, through, through modern times and into today. And, and, and how do we really, you know, what you said, appreci- to really appreciate and take interest in and see and understand each other so that we're actually deepening our relationship because it's only through healthier relationships that we're actually going to resolve our actual real world problems, not just through more and more abstract maps. Yeah. 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 Another thought too. I mean, if, if uh, you want to respond to that, you can. Otherwise, I can. I have another thought that that, that could lead to a question. What's your What's your other thought? Well, it's, um, well, actually, firstly, another thing it made me think of, too, just to recapitulate what you said, you made the point about Waldorf education, which I just wanted to double click on, because it really speaks to, again, a broader principle of decentralization, and really allowing the people who are close to the work to have agency. And I just wanted to highlight that another real key yeah. insight of Waldorf is the development of the agency and freedom of people. And one of the things that Steiner felt strongly about and is the basis of Walder schools is that they need to be independent, actually. So the, and this, again, it, it might speak to the, the, the separation of the social theories and that education really should not be controlled by the state. And that's a controversial and interesting thing for us to think about, because, you know, my understanding is that Steiner understood that public education, you know, state public education may have served a purpose at a moment in time. You know, the, the, the intention and the impetus to just spread knowledge and education that everyone has a right to free education, that, that's a really valuable and meaningful thing. Yeah. But the downside is 
partly what you were pointing to is that when you have the state of the government controlling education over the long run, you're going to you're going to come to serious problems that have to do with who controls the pedagogy and the philosophy and the disempowerment versus the empowerment of actual educators and school leaders. And I've actually done a lot of work in different kinds of schools. I've been researching different kinds of schools um, and wrote a book about that called Understanding Educational Complexity. That was very much trying to make the point of, you know, you can't really understand what's happening in a school if you don't understand all of the external forces that are impinging upon that school and all the ways that the students and the teachers and the school leaders are limited in what they can do by the social structures and the policies and the economics that surround them. And to have yeah. more independence would be liberating for that community of people. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not, and, and a question is, I'm wondering if this connects to, in one of the things of yours that I read, there was a reference to something called the objective basis for morality. And I'm wondering if that fits in here somewhere in terms of bringing back in objectivity, you know, like how do we, how do we get beyond the sort of subjective relativism and come to some sort of objective basis for morality? I wasn't really sure if I clearly understood what that meant. And I, I'm wondering if, if, if there's a connection there and, and if you can help me understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to. Um, or is that not a, if that's not a direct connection, that's okay too. Um, I don't know if I can uh, pull a direct connection. Um, let me think. Because um, we can always. Well, I can give more context to where that came from. Yeah. Because one yeah. of the things that you wrote, you're also talking about the importance of, and I think this is you know, maybe related to economics, like really seeing the interdependent connections between things so that when you think about the world that you're in, you know, like when, when you buy something at a grocery store, really seeing the farmers, right? Yeah. The fertilizers, the yeah. the capitalist structure that you're in, the shipping, yeah. right? The migrant workers, like really seeing the reality yeah. of, of that thing and all of those relationships. And there's something about um, wholeness. Like, I, I think that's part of your sense of the whole social. Like, you just need to yeah. see the whole. You can't just go into the supermarket with tunnel vision. You yeah. have to really see the whole you're a part of. So that's that's part of the move toward increased consciousness that we want to make and there's something objective about that right there's something that's yeah. like i can perceive that maybe a little bit differently than you can but there is an objective reality there of these networks and of these systems that we're embedded in is that is that somehow connected to the objective yeah. basis yeah yeah that is yeah. i mean that is that's I'm, I'm trying to tie it back to like all the things that we've yeah because yeah. I mean, you know as we speak it's like Fine. there's like fireworks so i'm like oh this yeah um, so i'll just take it wherever you want yeah, yeah, no, it's always just leaving the fireworks behind and being like, where are we right now? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, with what you're describing around um, economics, that is that is the kind of, in a certain way, the 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 kind of gesture, the work that that um, that comes out of this this way of viewing things. I mean, you could also describe social threefolding as societal holism. Um, it is a kind of how do we perceive the whole and the kind of um, the part that we're playing in the whole. And in that <clears throat> it does, yeah, it does create a different relationship to, I mean, very often our, our morality is based on our kind of point of view alone on our own sympathies and antipathies and kind of what we think is right. Um, but it's not necessarily based on a perception of the reality in front of us. So yeah, in, in economics, that's maybe one of the easier, um, examples um you know if we if we go around the grocery store and we think like we're buying things um and we've got our money and like that's what we're paying for these things with then that's just it's one perception and it's yeah it leads to kind of one outlook um but if we actually realized that the money was just a stand stand in for for what's actually taking place which is just people working for one another there's just people who have produced things and who have brought them to market and you know there's just all these there's just a whole world a whole kind of web of people who are meeting each other's needs and so that if if one is able to over time cultivate that awareness that other people are sacrificing themselves in a sense for for you they're giving their their time their energy their yeah their work for you um, then it does just create a different kind of ground to recognize 
yeah, one's place in the world, one's responsibility to the world. Um, it does create a ground for a different kind of morality, um, which is a more objective ground in which if people developed that capacity to perceive those relationships and ex were able to develop gratitude for that, I mean, that would arise, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, it does just create a different basis mm -hmm. for these things. So it is also, I mean, in terms of what you were describing with finding something which, um, finding a way out of relativism. Mm -hmm. um, this is, yeah, how I see that, that task is, can we actually come to, yeah, to perceive the whole and can we come to perceive how all these different um, parts, how all these different individuals and groups and communities exist within this whole. And from our, I mean, we'll still have our standpoint within that, but there is just a, there is an objective reality to it. I mean, there is, mm -hmm. you know, there's an objective reality to, yeah, all these different people with all their different soul lives and all their different value systems, like mm -hmm. existing together. And can we come to come yeah. to know them? Um, yeah. Yeah. And there are some, there are just some, there are some inherent and inevitable tensions between claims around, you know, seeing objective reality and having a sense of, understanding the wholeness of, of relationships and then that that of course implies that uh, there's a way of not doing that and not seeing that and that there is an uh an implicit or explicit value judgment there that it is better to actually cultivate these perceptions to cultivate one's consciousness to see the broader whole and it kind of brings me back to you know some of the tensions around the separation of the of the spheres and and the freedom of culture and I guess it's it's just a really complicated thing because we want to both value individuals and collectives and not force anything on people. And yet, back to these relationships, like we are embedded in interdependent relationships. We are all connected, right? Just mostly, even if even just through the economic lens, but also just in terms of media and culture too, and how we're influencing each other, our thoughts and our speech and our videos and our books and everything is influencing everyone else. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's, there also seems to me that to be this 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 fundamental interpenetration of law and economics and culture. You know, yeah. like they are interpenetrating and influencing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And whatever the culture is is going to influence what laws are made, right? Yeah. And, and 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 also going to influence economics and vice versa. So I yeah. I kind of almost it seems really really hard to separate them. And 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 there's also a sense in which there is no static culture partly because of these influences and this interpenetration there's a there's a perpetual evolution and even if you can point to some regressions or or it's not always getting better and better and better there's a perpetual change yeah. um, and I, I would say a an overall directionality toward increased complexity over time so yeah. how do you how do you kind of square that in terms of like you we, there's a way in which they're clearly interpenetrating and influencing each other yeah. and there's also value judgments around better and laws and worse laws, right? Better economic structures and worse economic structures, healthier cultures yep. and unhealthier cultures. Yep. So, you know, yep. how do we not just fall back into relativism by saying, oh, well, those should be kept separate and we just have to let those people do their thing? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely no actual separation in terms of um, them being, I mean, they are, they are distinct um, and you can come to recognize the differences um, but then they also do interpenetrate as you're describing. Um, but it's it's a question of where um, where what they're working out of. So what is the source of laws? What is the origin? What are the origin? You know, what's the origin of laws? And say like during Steiner's time, um, the Austrian Parliament was made up of four different groups, which are all different economic groups. You know, there were the landholder, there were the there was you know it was, it was four different kind of economic classes. Um, and they thought like this would be a good way of creating laws. They would bring all their, they're bring their different interests, but they were economic interests. Um, and so we see this. Yeah. I mean, obviously corporations, lobbyists, um, they're writing legislation, which then just gets taken up and kind of signed by, by lawmakers, um, because lawmakers don't have the time to, to know about all these different things. Um, but what does it mean when the law is being generated from outside of the sphere of rights consciousness, of the consciousness of the person who's they've come to power, not because they're a businessman 
um, and not because they're some great cultural figure, but because they have a sense of justice and equality and they want to do what's right um, for human beings as in the field of equality. Um, and yeah, whether what what should be the the influence of those other of those other spheres. And obviously what's created in the in the legal realm completely infuses those other spheres. We create property laws, we create labor laws, and that influences the economy. Um, but it's just a question of the directionality of it in a sense. Um, so yeah, whether or not, I mean, Steiner went so far as to say like all, you know, business schools, law schools, those should all be completely free cultural activities. If you have <clears throat> the government running law schools, um, then you just have kind of the old, you have the, you know, the old ideas kind of being imposed on the younger generation. And you don't necessarily have people who are inspired by, by rights and by law kind of working out of their own capacity. And if you have business schools that are just run out of, you know, what the economy thinks is needed, you should have, they should be still free endeavors. Um, they are still obviously cultural endeavors. They're, they're the life of the mind. They're working on ideas. Um, so it is, it's, yeah, one can like come to understand it in relationship to the directionality um, and just like where where should things originate from and then and then in, how do they influence each other? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's Steiner's picture with with culture is that it's it's the fountain for the other realms that it leads to all new political ideals. We think about the American Revolution or any of that. That's all new political inspirations that are coming. Um, and if we think about you know the realm of economics, it's all new innovations, all new inventions. It's you know. The realm of the entrepreneur of the creative person in in economics steiner calls the entrepreneur a, a cultural worker because that is the main activity there is cultural activity it's bringing a new idea into the world um so it's just recognizing how that activity that quality is permeating the economic sphere um mm -hmm. i didn't touch on the the value judgments thing but i mean i guess yeah i would just say if we look at the economy and um I mean, I would think most economists would agree. I know from like Adam Smith and others that like the point of the economy is to meet everybody's needs. Um, like that's the idea. You have a community, you kind of begin economic uh, activity together, you start exchanging. And and if you start doing that consciously together, it's like, okay, well, how are we going to do this so that we meet everybody's needs? Um, mm -hmm. And you can say like, maybe that's, yeah. So then the argument becomes, how do we actually do that? And some people say capitalism, some people say socialism, but the aim is still clear. And actually, if we look at how these things play themselves out, um, some things are actually, you know, healthier than others. Um, yeah. There are some activities and that's what everybody's kind of arguing about. But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think there's too much. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think we're doing it with with enough kind of clarity. Um, yeah. What the real objectives are. Yeah, I think there's a real loss of clarity, partly because of this. Again, I think this this sort of this sort of postmodern milieu where we're we're perpetually critiquing um, the some of the foundations and the basis of our society, and we're actually taking. I think we've taken a lot of things for granted. Like when I think of the dignities and the disasters of modernity, this separation of you know law and art and religion and culture is so crucial. We do have to find a way to keep it. Um, and I, I think it seems to me that the key thing would be maintaining the the um, equality under the law, like really having a, a lawful, you know, social structure where everyone really is treated equally in a very meaningful way creates yeah. potentially the freedoms to develop solidarity and to develop and to allow freedom in the realm of culture. Like it really we, we, we are we are very dependent on the laws that we are living because yeah. those yeah. impinge upon how free we are in our cultural expression and also how we're able to sort of develop solidarity in the realm of our relationships and i think one of the things that we're seeing one of the things that i'm seeing is you know another way of thinking about this sort of postmodern culture that's emerged is an emphasis on power and an emphasis on well because things are subjective and because things are relative therefore individuals are just going to be seeking power to benefit themselves and sort of justifying that in a way it's influenced the culture or that's sort of like taken as a given even maybe in an unconscious way and i think it also debases the underlying um legal structure of like no we're all equal like the like that's not relative like we have to have some shared 
foundation and shared understanding of equality, human equality as like the ground of everything else seems seems so crucial to me. And we have to find a way to sort of keep keep the foundational, fundamental, evolutionary, emergent social qualities that emerge through the modern world system and then keep refining and but maintaining that separation and, and, and allowing people to be as free as possible while living in a sense of being safe because you're protected by laws that treat everyone equally. It's really, it's really so key, but obviously easier said than done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, in a certain way, what you're describing, I mean, it is in a certain way, the political life is, is a kind of basis for the, for the social life and recognizing this fundamental equality um, between individuals. I mean, we come together in a community and we say like, how do we want to work together and what kind of agreements do we want to make? And every, you know, in the modern world, one of the things um, that's emerged is this really strong democratic impulse, which is just the desire for everyone to have their say in how things kind of are happening. Um, it hasn't really developed very well, meaning like, yeah, people don't actually particularly self-govern. I mean, there isn't, this is one of the things that I've been writing a little bit more about recently. Um, but over, yeah, over the last couple of years also, it's just you know, what would it mean? There are forms of direct democracy and open democracy for people where they could participate. But if we took the idea of self-governance really seriously, mm. how would we do that? So have you ever participated in, have you ever done jury duty? I have not. Yeah. So everybody, yeah. myself included, tries to avoid it. Um, you know, it's just kind of, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I was just talking with a friend and it's just like, it just seems like maybe it's this drag, but it was such an interesting experience. The one time I got called into a jury mm -hmm. to actually be asked like to play a part in the kind of civic life mm -hmm. and, and say like, you know, it was a cop who had one perception and a, and another person who uh, he was claiming, you know, committed some crime. And we had to kind of judge what, you know, what took place. Um, and to be kind of that actively involved um, is just, it's a completely different experience to have your, to have what your your role in society um, and especially the the realm of governance to have that role matter is like quite an experience. Um, yeah. Also, yeah, it was at Occupy Wall Street and the General Assembly every night, where everybody would have a vote and it was consensus based. It was just yeah, it was just kind of a, an amazing experience. So, yeah, I think that is it does need to be the the fundamental basis of of what we're doing, um, and then but we also need to see that what the limits of it are. So one of the limits is that we should only be deciding about things in society as equals that we're actually equal in deciding. So meaning like for us to kind of come together as just a community of a hundred people and say like, oh, you're gonna educate the children and we're gonna tell you what to educate. Even though the educator, that's their job and they actually know, you know, they actually know the children, pedagogy, curriculum, all of these things. Um, or else for us to tell a farmer, like this is what you should farm. Like it just, this is where we overstep our boundaries and where we make, Steiner describes it as making making um, the law a lie, like making a lie out of it because we're no longer equal there. Um, yeah. So we're not, we're not, we're not taking equality seriously when we yeah, do that. I was, I was, yeah, I was having a similar thought just in terms of we, that there's a, there's a, there's a capacity that's required of all of us to sort of be able to take a, it, it's pretty simple, but it's still a form of both and thinking in the sense that there's a way that we're all equal and there's ways in which we're not equal, right? And that yeah. should be obvious, yeah. but having clarity about that is really important. You know, the, the, the wise woman is not equal to the immature adolescent. And there needs to be um, what my friend Zach Stein calls teacherly authority, right? We, we need to have room for healthy hierarchy. And there yeah. are students, there's difference between students and teachers. You know, but what are the contexts within which we can acknowledge that and then never lose sight of the way in which at, at a ground level, we are all fundamentally equal humans. And even that is relevant in Waldorf education and all education in the relationship between adults and children. There is a way in which we are not equal and there are power dynamics there, which hopefully are healthy and benevolent. But also the way you treat a child is with a sense yeah. to their sacred uniqueness and individuality and agency and who they are as as a spiritual being and, and and a deep respect and honor for that, even as you are wielding power and trying to educate them. And, and with that, I wanna I wanna bring us before we close to a question on technology and then maybe bring it back to education at the end. One of the essays that you wrote that I also appreciated was about the chat GPT, the world's greatest faker, is what you called it. 
And I really, I, I like your, the, the gist of what you were saying there, because it's sort of acknowledging the potentials of this technology and there's different, there's different ways that it can be applied. And it's clearly going to be more and more of a presence in our lives. But the place that you took it was really to point to how, you know, things like this can help us to become more conscious of what we're losing in society. Because as we, as we sort of give over more and more of our agency and our capacity and even our thought and language now to technology and artificial intelligence, there's, there's definitely a danger that we're going to lose something there. We're, we, we're going to become incapacitated potentially, but it also just shines a light on the difference between a conscious being and, and either a non-conscious being or less conscious being, depending on how you look at it. But, but really, you know, you're, I, I have a quote here from you that it's certainly true that artificial intelligence can make human intelligence redundant, but it can also help us recognize the treasure that is consciousness. I just wonder if you wanted to say anything about that or technology more broadly in terms of how, what, what have you learned from, from Steiner, Walder, social prefolding that has given you some guidance in regard to how we should be in relationship to technology as, as that continues to evolve in the 21st century? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, it's also a really broad one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll just, I'll just maybe stay with the kind of like point and kind of like draw it out a little bit more, um, that I made in that essay. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, all of the steps, chat GTP is just, um, like the kind of largest, um, the largest kind of stride we've made in that, in that realm recently, but with every single step, you can see how we, I mean, it does each each new kind of development and technology does have a certain kind of it, it opens up a new realm a new realm of possibility um and it also closes off certain realms and so to kind of become aware of what we're what we what it possibly opens up what we potentially gain from it and what we lose is i think the 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 realm that we need to begin to kind of develop our consciousness in and so yeah i mean in terms of i don't think i mentioned maps in there but um but just what is it to to develop a sense of of um, geography? What is it to to be educated to 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 learn about the lay of the land and to also in one's life as one moves through the the world um, feel a relationship to these different places and how you know just know inwardly what it means to get there, what it means to be there, what it means to kind of move through those spaces, um, and what is the kind of sense of you know, being at home. I had an experience once I was in Prague. I'd never been in Prague before and I was walking all around the city. And then I came back to a place where I'd, where I'd been before. And I was like, Oh, I've been here before. And it was interesting because all of a sudden everything was new, 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 and kind of raw and a little bit painful. And then all of a sudden I came back to a place I knew and it was like, Oh, like this is smooth. Like I can feel like this is, this is, it felt a little bit like home. You know, all of a sudden there was a feeling of like, Oh, I can breathe. I can like let myself like settle here a little bit because I knew the place just in the most mm -hmm. basic sense of the word. But that is in a sense what happens is that we we become rooted in the world by knowing it. And we we yeah, we do just develop a relationship to the world and to ourselves in a completely different way than if we just always use GPS. If we just always are told, I'm not actually even looking at the world. I'm just looking at my phone. It's telling me to take a right here. I'm going to take a right here. Um, it's just so dramatically different. And yeah, you know, there are so many different language um, tools now where you can just speak into your phone and then it translates it into whatever language. But what is it to learn a language? Like, what is it to learn how to do anything? It it sculpts your inner life. Like it it it's you taking your inner life and like making something out of it. Like Like, you know, it's it's you know forging something out of your inner life and that might matter it, it just might not yeah. might not just matter in yeah. this life because you can make more money but it might it might matter in terms of how you feel at home in the world how you feel human in the world and if we're at, if there's actually a point to human beings being on the earth so i mean this is just it's a little bit you know a picture that for some people they'll be like i don't know if i agree with that but steiner's picture is really that that human beings come into the world in order to learn and in order to like develop their souls. And then they leave the earth again when they die and then they come back. And it's this kind of constant evolution with the earth and what we develop in ourselves 
in our consciousness is what is matters. It's like the, the essentializing activity, but, you know, we keep on like essentializing the seed and that's what's, you know, continues to like grow from incarnation to incarnation. And in a certain way, you know, that's in a certain, you can imagine that as like, that's kind of what matters. Like, how do we take hold of our souls and transform them in this life? Um, if you just think this is the one life we live, then maybe it's just to kind of, you know, have a life of ease and comfort and satisfaction until you die. But if you take the human soul, which is just such a strange reality, seriously, in a sense, if you, yeah, if you just look at it and say like, what are we doing here? Then yeah, yeah. developing soul life is, that soul spiritual nature is, yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. That, and not only might it be important, it might be the most important thing at least as a human, from the perspective of the human, what is more important than who you are as a human? How are you evolving as a being? Yeah. And it's all, I also feel a deep connection with what you were saying about Goethe before in terms of just bringing a certain awareness and appreciation and understanding and relationship to the reality that you're embedded in, in a very embodied, very real way you know like cultivating your soul your awareness your consciousness in relationship to the world around you and the more that we can bring mindfulness to that and attention to that and not get swept up in um more abstract or sort of one distance removed notions of what's going on in the world but stay in our body stay in our experience what what is in a very concrete way the difference between um having ai do things for you and being on your phone a lot versus just living in the world in, in a more conscious and embodied way and like that's just even just in the even just in the in the window of your current life if you pay attention you're going to notice a very big difference experientially of the quality of your life i think and then the frame that you're giving too i think is also very relevant even bigger picture than that who are you and why are you here and do you really want to is that really how you want to spend this lifetime outsourcing your work um as opposed to cultivating yourself through work yeah you know yeah these are deep deep distinctions yeah maybe i just say that mm -hmm. that is like a, the in a certain way the fundamental essence of threefolding that the question is like what have we come here to do everyone has certain gifts certain capacities can we have our relationship to society be such that we're we're trying to find out how all these capacities can be developed and then how they can kind of find a place how those gifts can be given so that everyone can benefit from them um and yeah just recognizing you know santa wrote this uh, this book when he was quite young early 30s uh called philosophy of freedom which was about the development of of human consciousness was about the development of freedom because you can see your own motivations and understand why you're doing them. And then you can, you can choose instead to work out of love. And Steiner describes his book toward social renewal, which is his basic book on social life as a sequel to it. And now it's a question of how can we form society in a way so that human beings have freedom to work out of themselves, out of their own individuality, but so that they can also work out of love into society, meeting each other's needs, serving one another. Mm -hmm. um, so it is all about, yeah, culture is the realm where we where we develop our consciousness and where we help each other develop one another's consciousness. So it is a very like, yeah, you can talk about it without talking about the spirit or without talking about spiritual development yeah. and just talk about yeah. you know, in, in, as the life of the mind. But it is very much a picture of like how do we how do we create society so that it allows people to to be as inspired as possible by the spirit, to be as inspired as possible to bring what they have to serve others um, and to meet the world in a way. Mm -hmm. um yeah that makes them want to yeah. So, yeah yeah brother that's um yeah well said and i feel i feel so blessed to be in conversations like this and to meet fellow travelers and also i, I feel blessed to be a part of the educational community that i'm a part of um here at kimberton waldorf school if you ever have a chance to visit if you're ever in the pennsylvania philly area please feel free to to stop by i'd love to give you a tour um, it, there, there's a lot, there's a lot that informs the curriculum and the pedagogy and the intentionality and the mission and the meaning and the purpose of education and of Waldorf education. There's a lot to pull out of Steiner. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of pulling out some good threads today. So yeah, thank you so much. Is any other final words you wanted to end with or any, any plugs you want to make where people can find you? Um, 
Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the whole social, that's definitely helpful. Um, I mean, that's kind of like the best place to find me. Um, okay. and yeah, in relationship to that work, I mean, I did write a 12 lesson course. I was asked to kind of create a, a distance learning course on threefolding. Mm -hmm. So it is a course that people go through, they get a lesson a month and they work through it and I tutor them in it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a constant kind of work. Um, but yeah, the whole social, if they want to just kind of okay. encounter it refolding and say how do how do you understand kind of contemporary events in relationship to this stuff yeah. and that's the whole social at substack.com okay uh, wonderful i'll be happy to point keep pointing people toward that yeah thanks Thank so, much, so much for your time Seth. yeah no it was great to uh to be in conversation likewise all right bye yeah. take care ben